Our speaker today is um, Scott Wall. And Scott graduated from the United States Naval Academy in 1981 and then, and then embarked on a very successful naval career with the submarine force. However, his life changed significantly on February 9, 2001. There, Commander Waddle gave the order for an emergency surfacing maneuver that inadvertently uh, caused a collision of his 9,000-ton submarine and a fishing boat in, that uh, actually resulted in nine people uh, being killed. And so really what has happened since that has been significant in uh, Scott Waddle's life and is really a good uh, example of some things for us on courageous leadership. So without further ado, I'd like to ask Scott Waddle to please come up. I'd like to start the program by saying that the fact that I'm standing here talking about this story is not something that I'm particularly proud of. It's a professional and a personal embarrassment to me. And as a professional and as a warrior, a graduate of the Naval Academy, a 20-year submarine veteran, our crew, the team that I led, in essence, broke a code or a, a trust, if you will, with a group of civilians that ultimately perished. Nine people died on February 9th of 2001 when the submarine I commanded the USS Greenville collided with a Japanese fisheries training ship called the Ahimi Maru. I'll tell you the story about that collision. It was an accident. This wasn't an act of war. These were innocent civilians that perished. And for that, I'm deeply remorseful. And I live with that burden each and every day. It's not a day that passes that I don't reflect upon that. But the purpose of today's program is to share with you, leaders with, not only within your industry, within your community, the school, opportunities that you have to influence the lives of others is to share with them the story and I believe the message that in life you can have setbacks and disappointments, but those disappointments don't necessarily have to define who you are as an individual. What does define you are the actions that you take as a leader. It's easy to stand in the presence of a group and celebrate successes, to celebrate the team's success, the achievements of the organization. But what happens when things go poorly? When I visited one company a few months ago, I asked the senior VP of HR, I said, how many people work here? And he looked at me and candidly said, about 40%. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Some people just come in and punch the card, and they're not really there as productive laborers. And a lot of it has to do with the environment that is fostered within the organization. Be accessible, be visible. Don't just be a name in a Rolodex on a PDA or whatever, a photograph on a wall. If you get out and you walk your organization and people see you and you're leading by being present amongst those that you work with, it's amazing the kind of response you get back from your team. John Paul Johns, an old Navy guy from years ago, had a saying, praise in public, reprove in private. Remember that. People like to be praised often for what they do. Now, not everyone likes to celebrate successes. Why? Because there are people that believe, I come to work, I have a job to do. Tell me when I'm not doing my job. Otherwise, leave me alone. It's important to know them. It's important to know those other individuals that need the positive strokes, the pats on the back, the reassurance, the encouragement. Improve the quality of life where you can, and the last thing is you have to be accountable for your actions. You see, as leaders, you can't delegate this. You can't give it away. You're here this morning. But back at the office, if something goes poorly, you still own it. The team fails, and they make mistakes when you're on vacation. If you're on travel, you still own it. It doesn't matter how you try to spin it, you can, you can try to give it away, but you really can't, because in the end, the buck stops with you. And on that day, 10 miles off the coast, with vessels about 9 nautical miles hovering close to Honolulu and to Diamond Head, I didn't know that there was a third vessel, the Amy Maru, that was bearing down in our position. It would ultimately collide with it, sink the vessel, and kill 9 individuals. This video is going to summarize what happened on that fateful day. 12.31 p.m. The sonar operators aboard the Greenville monitor and track a surface contact. It's assigned the number S-13. The Greenville and contact S-13 are operating in an area about 9 miles south of the Hawaiian island of Oahu. 1.31 p.m. Aboard the Greenville, the day trip for the civilian guests is coming to an end. But Commander Scott Waddle 
has one last exercise he wants to demonstrate to his guests. Maybell's tank blow is a, is a maneuver that a submarine performs in the event of an emergency, say a flooding condition or a condition that requires it to rapidly ascend to the surface. One thing about the emergency main ballast tank blow is once the procedure is initiated, the submarine is going in one direction, and that's up. 1.37 p.m. Before this maneuver can be carried out, the Greenville comes to periscope depth to check for any conflicting surface traffic. But I took the periscope, not expecting and not anticipating that there was a close contact, such as the Amy Morrow. And when I looked down the lines of bearing to where contacts were based upon fire control system, I saw nothing did a low power sweep, and didn't detect the vessel. Sonar believes contact S-13 is miles away at a range of 16,000 yards. In fact, it's much closer, actually only 3,000 yards away, and closing at a speed of 11 knots. Commander Waddle invites a few civilian guests to participate with the emergency main ballast blow, but only under close supervision of the crew. 1.42 p.m. The Greenville is 400 feet below the surface. When I was confident that there were no ships in close proximity to our vessel that would be a hazard, we ordered the initiation of the emergency blow. The 6,900-ton submarine is heading towards the surface at a speed of 14 knots and at a 15-degree angle. The crew and students aboard the Hime Maru are going about their normal business. It was at 100 feet when the first bang the first uh, sensation of impact took place. It felt as if the stern of the ship was being lifted up above the sea. As I was watching the captain, his face turned white. And he said, Jesus, what the hell was that? So again, a deck man then he told me that a submarine was rising from the rear port side. And then as I increased the magnification on the periscope, I could see high school. Those were the first words that I could plainly read, and then I read Iwo Jima. And I thought to myself, oh my God, you know, this is a, this is a school boat. We've, we've hit a vessel with kids. We got up. I looked immediately outside. I saw something like a submarine right next to our boat. <coughs> and our ship was already starting to go down. The Greenville puts out an emergency call to Navy headquarters, who in turn radio the Coast Guard. as our submarine was racing and trying to get to that position when the Himimaru's stern went beneath the surface and more rapidly the bow, as I would say the forward third of the vessel, pointed up. And then within seconds disappeared. Watching the Hemi Maru disappear from view was clearly the darkest moment in my life. Recognizing a collision had taken place, the periscope was trained astern as we're heading towards Oahu, away from the point of impact, now three quarters of a mile away from our position. I'm taking all this in. I see the vessel floundering, listening astern to starboard. I cry out in the control room, we've had a collision, sound the collision alarm. 
Bring ship for general emergency. Make damage control reports to control. This is the captain. I have the con. Helm all hit full. Left full rudder. Helps to get speed onto the vessel. You get the submarine turning away from land back to the south to the point of impact where this vessel in distress was soon to sink and disappear from view. I cry out in the control room. We've had a collision. Sound the collision alarm. Bring ship for general emergency. Make damage control reports to control. This is the captain. I have the con. Helm all hit full. Left full rudder. When the on-scene commander arrived an hour later, he said we've got them all, the light graphs were slashed in the sun. I said a prayer from the bridge. I said, thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. I could live with the fact the vessel was sunk. I couldn't live knowing that individuals perished in a sense of 45 minutes later, when we pulled into Honolulu Town, into that little harbor area, they announced on Channel 16 that 10 were unaccounted for. It was as if somebody had taken their fist, jammed it into my chest, and ripped out my heart. I wanted to scream, God, no! Anything but this God, please, no, God! Nine people had actually perished. The very next morning when we returned to port at 10 a.m., when we rounded the bend of Hospital Point, in my front yard were 300 media personnel with their cameras all pointing out into the channel. Helicopters hovering three overhead. I knew the graveness of the situation. It was unfolding before me, but I had no idea the enormity of the challenge that lay ahead. Fired from my job at 1 p.m., I cleared out my personal effects that afternoon on the boat in less than five minutes, and I went home. Not before I told my crew, though, how embarrassed I was and sorry for the pain that this had caused my families. But I asked them to remember what they saw and not to embellish their story, and in the days where a court of inquiry or an investigation was held, to tell the truth, to say what they saw. And if they didn't have an answer to a question, to say that you don't know. We all made mistakes that day, but I'm the one that's responsible. I pushed the crew. I abbreviated process. I cut corners that day because I thought it was safe and prudent to do so, and I was wrong. I would take the stand. I would testify without immunity, and I would engage the admirals for eight grueling hours that last day of the end of the second week. Shocked at the idea that this captain is taking the stand without any kind of protection almost seemed to be unprecedented, and I couldn't figure out why. And I told Charlie, I'm taking the stand. He said, Scott, you don't have immunity. Whatever you say can be used against you. And a court martial said, Charlie, the families want to hear from me. They need to understand the choices and the decisions I made. In the late afternoon hours that Friday, the admirals quit calling me commander, my rank, and addressed me as captain. My formal title was a sign of respect for what I had done. Not every officer, whether you're a corporate leader or a military man or woman, will do what's right in a time of tragedy or crisis. The bottom line is this. In life, when you have a setback and a disappointment, don't let that incident or event define who you are. Keep your integrity and your character intact as a leader, because in the end, accountability is what it's all about.